This is Tom Fox. Welcome to a special five-part podcast series on the fight to secure supply chains through cross-industry innovation. This podcast series is sponsored by Exeter. In this series, we will explore the ongoing efforts of Exeter to lead the discussion and enhancement of supply chain risk management. First, word about Exeter's Supply Chain Explorer. Today, risk management professionals and procurement professionals are swamped. A new artificial intelligence risk detection tool is helping Fortune 500 companies and government agencies surface, understand, and mitigate critical threats to their third party and supplier networks literally within hours. Introducing Supply Chain Explorer, a groundbreaking AI platform developed by Exeter, a leading global risk and compliance SaaS company. Exeter Supply Chain Explorer is a next generation platform built on award-winning AI that delivers instantaneous transparency, allowing you to meet the urgent imperative to protect global supply chains from sanctions, ESG, and cyber risk at unprecedented speed and scale. With single-click supply chain detection, high-level due diligence, and risk analysis, everyone can now join the fight to secure our global supply chains. For the first time, you can even spot potential disruptions before they impact your supply chain. Check out Exeger's Supply Chain Explorer. In this episode three, we discuss supply chain issues and information and communications technology with Skylar Chi and Andrew Lehman. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Skylar Chai and Andrew Lehman. And we're going to take a look at supply chain risk issues in the information and communications technology and telecommunications space. So, gentlemen, first of all, welcome. And thank you both so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thanks for having us, Tom. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you both if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you're doing now uh, in your professional background. And Skylar, I'll start with you. Great. Thanks, Tom. So I am the Deputy Global Head of Third Party and Supply Chain Risk Management at Exeger. My primary role is aligned to the strategic focus of our firm, which is to make the world a safer place to do business. On a daily basis, we help the largest governments in the world and some of the largest institutions with Revenues the size of some small governments harden their not only supply chains, but vendor ecosystems so that indeed we do make the world a safer place to do business. Andrew? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, um, I'm Andrew Lehman. I'm an associate director at Exeger. I have several years of background in investigations and due diligence. And more recently at Exeger, I've been serving as an account manager, serving our clients for our supply chain risk and third-party risk management services. So one of the things that uh, really intrigued me about this subject matter and why I was so excited to visit with you all is that uh, this particular profession or discipline or industry really has a dual challenge because uh, anyone who thinks about uh uh, I, ICT or telecom obviously thinks about hardware, but they also think about software. So, Andrew, if maybe I could start with you uh, on an overview or, or 30,000 foot level. What are some of the key risks uh, that you see? Or maybe the question is, what kinds of conversations are you having with clients now about the risks uh, in this environment as we were recording this in May 2022? Yeah, that is a great point about the dual challenge. And I'd say it's by no means unique to this particular industry, but it's definitely something that I think companies that operate in the IT or telecom space are sensing more acutely than companies may in other industries. And that's largely due to their business involving so much storage of sensitive customer data and facilitating the transmission of that data all over the world. There's a lot of attack vectors, if you will, on the infrastructure that they're setting up and supporting. I mean, the industry as a whole, um, they have to contend with multiple types of third party and supply chain risk. Uh, at one level, speaking of just from the U.S. national security perspective, these companies, they have to make efforts to assess and monitor for their exposure to espionage, sabotage or other interference efforts from adversarial nations 
which of course has informed many of the supply chain related regulatory developments during the course of uh, the current and previous administrations. You know, this includes outright bans on certain Chinese telecom firms from operating in the U.S. at all to, to um, efforts to at least deter the use of certain Chinese made telecom equipment. And it's not just theoretical either. We've seen reporting over the just a few years that has revealed at the behest of Chinese intelligence services, there have been Chinese subcontract subcontractors that have actually planted malicious chips onto equipment like server motherboards that were ultimately used by a U.S. telecom firm. Um, you know, you that, yeah, sorry, that. that is such an interesting area of exploration that you bring up um, and really in my mind has recently evolved over the past four to five years, or at least now we're looking into this. I believe the example that you're referencing is in roughly 2018, Amazon was evaluating a potential acquisition to ha help with the expansion of their video service. And they had found in that small telecommunications startup, that acquisition, that, and this is, this is so unbelievably fascinating to me, that China had injected their wares into the supply chain and it actually embedded a chip, right? If I remember correctly, Andrew, embedded a chip, a tiny little rice sized grain into the telecommunication server. And the only way that Amazon really figured this out was they tore apart that logic bearing system down to the surface level of the PCB boards, the literal chip boards, and put them under microscopes and compared them to blueprints and said, that's not supposed to be there. And that's where we're headed, I think, globally as the West in, in reviewing for our supply chain um, malicious actors, really. And it, it's fascinating you bring that up. I, I kind of geek out on how they've injected it. Literally, a grain-sized piece of rice into a logic-bearing system just is where we're at today, and it's, it's fascinating. And Andrew, if I could add, that was the basis of the North Korean hack of the Bangladesh Central Bank uh, using SWIFT codes to uh, steal, uh, they tried to steal uh, over 800 billion. They only got away with, uh, I think, 150, not billion, uh, uh, 800 million. They only got away with 150 million. But uh, that type of attack is something we have seen, as uh, Skyler noted, uh, in the past from state actors. So how does how does a how do you help a client really, or how do you counsel them on? Uh, preventing or detecting attacks from state actors in that situation? Yeah, there's a couple different ways of going about this. And I think one of the most important starting places is really getting a handle on whether or not you have an over-reliance in your supply chain concentrated in one geographic area or perhaps one country in particular. And not just that, but you might have an over-reliance on a single supplier, just one company one manufacturing facility in one country that is specialized into producing equipment to your specifications, whether it's a PCB or another semiconductor type chip. Um, and, and one of the ways we'll, that we approach that is that we want to take a look at who are all of your direct suppliers, and then let's go a, a few levels deeper and learn more about their entire supply chain and find out how much of that is based in one country, let's say, for example, China. By and large, we're seeing that China dominates a lot of the spaces for some critical equipment that uh, companies in this industry are using, right? If you look at, um, you know, as an example, printed circuit boards, they're really the building blocks of our modern electronic devices, right? 90% of the manufacturing facilities for PCBs um, are in Asia, primarily East Asia. Of course, we have countries like Taiwan and South Korea are included there where the industry has grown rapidly very recently. But still, more than half of those factories are in China. Um, so you're seeing a lot of risk just in terms of that geographic concentration there. And once you see that, you know that there are increased vectors for an adversarial nation like China to perhaps influence the operations of subcontractors or, or companies operating factories in that location. If I could really pick up on that point... Uh, and maybe broaden out to um, just hardware uh, more broadly, rather. Um, beyond printed circuit boards, um, Taiwan, for instance, uh, has a very vibrant economy and supplier basis right now. And, and for the last 
least since all of us have been alive, Taiwan is a very valuable ally of the United States, but they are at geopolitical risk because where they sit across the Straits of Formosa from China. Uh, China. Uh, so how do you uh, help a company to think through risks uh, uh, involving allies and longtime allies uh, that may disrupt uh, the supply chain or uh, in other ways cause disruptions? Yeah, Taiwan is a fascinating example. There's no doubt that it was already something on the radar of a lot of companies in this space, but it's just only become more salient in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, right? As soon as that happened, everyone starts thinking ahead, well, we've already been worrying about China's designs on Taiwan, which are well known. And now we have to think, well, this is happening in real life in front of our eyes uh, with Russia and Ukraine. Could this happen sooner than we think with China and Taiwan? And that's obviously something that could cause a massive di uh, disruption to critical supplies for a lot of U.S. and co Western companies, right? Um, when you look at just server manufacturing alone, 90% of that is accounted for by uh, companies headquartered in Taiwan. Of course, many of their manufacturing facilities are in mainland China, um, but that doesn't change the fact that the geopolitical risk could cause a massive disruption there. So when we talk to our clients, we're really what we're getting at, can we illuminate that supply chain, find out how much of your supplies are being sourced to Taiwanese companies, and let's look at how maybe we could diversify that supplier base. Can we find other companies operating in other locations outside of Taiwan? Maybe it's South Korea. Maybe it's hopefully increasingly the U.S. And we'll see how the legislation that's currently going through the Senate and the House uh, comes to pass, which may incentivize more manufacturing of things like semiconductors in the U.S., although that's going to take several years, right? So we have to do things now, which is more about gaining the knowledge of your supply chain and finding ways to diversify where you can in the immediate future um, to try to mitigate that risk as much as possible. I think, I think one thing to add there as well, um, and Andrew, it's such an excellent point. One, one thing to build upon that, that we've, we've just seen a seismic shift in the way that our clients think about globalization in the world. And a big part of what we do on a daily basis is retraining what would have otherwise been an old school of thought of, you know, I order a server rack, I don't care where the parts come from. And today we are now asking the questions and we're establishing frameworks for us to realize that we may need to diversify ourselves away from Taiwan semiconductor industry, for example, where 53% of global chips are made. And that shift, that mental shift and asking the right questions and training who we work with to ask those questions is actually creating real world impacts. And so we're seeing new fabrication facilities built intentionally um, all over the world, not just concentrated in those regions. And a big part of what we do is handholding and being experts to them. Let me change the focus of the question just a little bit yet again. You've talked to us about the conversation to have, and now I'd like to turn to who do you have that conversation with? Many of the listeners of this podcast will be like myself, a compliance officer in the corporate compliance function, perhaps a chief compliance officer. Uh, other listeners are going to be supply chain professionals who deal with this on a day to day basis. Uh, others may be other uh, senior level executives up, up to the uh, CEO and the board. But one of the concerns I've had uh, uh, really come to the fore since uh, the Russian invasion, for instance, has been the siloed nature around ICT and telecommunications and are the concepts that you guys are talking about and bringing to clients, uh, is it leading to a, a company to reassess the siloed nature of how they look at this to a much more holistic approach to supply chain risk management in this area? <laughs> I this is such an interesting, just really management philosophy at core. Um, I think historically what the standard guess would be is, well, supply chains deal with purchasing and purchasing is done by procurement. And so procurement will be the risk stewards and the risk owners that have a responsibility to look into the issues we've talked about today. Overwhelmingly, what we've seen over the last two years is that various stakeholders from across the business have really formed working groups and can consistently communicate with each other. 
So you will have procurement working with the IT security professionals to perform vendor reviews of software bills of material for the hardware vendors that any given firm may be purchasing from. And what we've also seen is an evolution of the board wishing to protect shareholder value against those working groups. And so they've also stepped in. And so while it would be easy to point at any one given person within a firm, what, what we've absolutely seen is that it is a collective group effort across some of the world's largest enterprises working together as we should um, with that background subject matter expertise of IT security, of procurement, of even diversity and inclusivity with um, the vendors that we're buying from outside of risk and all stakeholders in the business are really now putting their budgets on the line to make those decisions. I, I'm, Andrew, I'm curious to see what you've seen in some of the larger firms you're working with. Yeah, Tom, there's no doubt that it's a, a major challenge for these firms to make the kind of conversion that you're referring to there. We are pivoting to a more holistic view of supply chain risk. It's where a lot of companies want to be. They're just having difficulty getting there because it takes, of course, a commitment of resources, a commitment of philosophy from leadership. And it takes having a, a framework in place and also the tools in place to actually execute on whatever framework you have. Um, this is just simply put, it's not easy. And I think that a lot of firms are, they're making progress in this regard it's maybe a little bit slow and gradual, but they are moving into that space more and more because they're seeing the value that comes with it. Everyone wants that 360 view. They want to go as deep as possible into their supply chain. They want more knowledge. But as you brought it out, you're taking in tons of data and it can be hard to synthesize it to something simple that makes sense that just points to directly where the risk is so that you know uh, where to focus your resources, which are always limited in many cases. Um, yeah. What, what's interesting too, and Andrew, you hit really hit at this point, is that no decisions are made in a vacuum. And I think organizations in many ways are, are oftentimes forced to make a decision, whether it's demand side pull from the market or a regulatory atmosphere that requires a decision to be made. And between the executive orders to protect America's supply chain that President Biden signed into law last February, to the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act in December, these are now broad regulatory brush strokes that change the tone at the top of every corporation in the world, not only ICT and telecommunications, um, to bring those decisions together. And, and it makes it easier for these firms to make those choices to dig deep into their supply chains as well. Gentlemen, I now like to turn to software because ICT companies uh, really face a different set of risks with software. And Skylar, if, maybe I could start with you. Uh, what do you see as those different risks? And how do you help a company understand <clears throat> the difference and then put in a, an effective risk management strategy around software? Software is such a fascinating evolution of supply chain risk management. Software is, is difficult. There are no tangible fingerprints of a software bills of material, for example, that we can identify in the same way that when a shipment is made into a country, we, we see the goods cross borders. And so there's a different way of thinking about supply chains. We have to identify inside of enormous data volumes what we can use to risk rate supply chain vendors. And you know, a cool area of exploration today is that we are data mining LinkedIn and Indeed and Monster.com, for example, to see software bills of material for any software provider. We can see through employees posting what they use to create certain software. So um, four months ago, for example, the Apache Software Foundation maintains a coding library called Log4J. And Log4J effectively, whenever a user performs an action in a, in a piece of software, um, it records the user's action. And there was a remote exploitation vulnerability, one of the largest we've seen in the last 10 years that allowed anybody to really take control of a piece of software using an exploitation in Log4j. And the question then became, well, how are we exposed to those risks? How do we mitigate against those risks? How do we find those risks? We don't have shit manifest. We don't have bills of lading. And today what we're providing for, really the market is providing for is 
identification of the fingerprints when issues like log4j are known to see where in our supply chains we may be exposed. Um, monitoring for those risks against who may be the most critical in supply chains. And then ultimately metricizing where you may be most exposed across your enterprise. For example, you have one vendor that has several of those log4j types or solar winds issues embedded into them. So between risk stratification um, and leveraging documents that we never before have leveraged before to illuminate supply chains, we're able to give a much more literal site picture of what software vulnerabilities may look like. Um, and then we enrich that data with other best in class firm uh, information that digs deep into supply chain, not only supply chain vulnerabilities, but cyber vulnerabilities. Like, do software vendors have login pages that you can brute force with a bot network without a CAPTCHA, for example? And so we need to think about this landscape and these threat vectors and attack surfaces while also providing really actionable intelligence. We can't overwhelm people with data, so you need a single pane of glass view to receive those risks and identify those risks and investigate them. With, um, look, can I focus on the Apache Log4j uh, incident for a little bit longer, Skylar? Maybe or a couple in, hours for that one. <laughs> well, what, uh, what I really wanted to focus on was the, not so much the downstream effects, but how companies which had availed themselves uh, of this open source software uh, were put at risk as well. Does that mean uh, if I've been in business for 20 years and I'm in the oil field service business, I've got some code that reads some uh, a product or oil down hold, it's uh, open sourced, it's been built and improved, and we're now one of the top uh, sellers of this software that we, we literally have to go back to um, every open source that we have used, or is it, uh, did I misconstrue that? No, you're you're exactly right, and I think this is a challenge <laughs> in the industry today. I talking more specifically about the log4j issue. Not only is it open source, and it, it was a very simple library that is used in hundreds of thousands of, of really software globally. Um, but one of the issues there was not only is it open source. Not only did any given company build their software not maintaining that source code. But the vendor that maintains the library, I, I actually researched this. There was a comment on the vendor's message board that said, hey, can we put this feature in the product? And three months later, the developer said, yeah, hey, it's in the product without any um, public comment period without any review of the downstream effects of that software change. And because companies have taken for granted these open source libraries, they, they didn't think to look at what a, a potential version update of Log4j um, would do to their software. It's, it's all taken for granted today and, and people really aren't looking at it. Um, I don't know if companies can avail themselves of those risks because they're so, these open source libraries today are so ubiquitous in software development. We need rigid structures now around open source to ensure that the risks don't evolve into log four shell. Um, gentlemen, we've talked about not the what or how you communicate these risk and risk management strategies. And, and we talked about the who I'd now like to focus specifically on the boards of directors and how do you help a board understand not these risks, uh, but really the board role and oversight. Uh, the board should not get down into the weeds, at least in my opinion, um, but they should occasionally test. But uh, what when you guys sit down with boards, how do you explain this risk to them? But how do you explain more importantly, their role in an overall supply chain risk management strategy around ICT? I think that the board's role, and Andrew, if you don't mind me taking this one, the, um, the board's role, well, boards have a lot of roles, but I think one of the roles is to set the tone at the top of any given organization. And you need to align the shareholders values and the board arguably does that to the strategic vision of any given enterprise. But when we work with boards, we need to provide that management information that's tangible to your point without getting too far in the weeds. But most importantly, 
the lack of risk detection of any given enterprise's supply chains, whether it's commerce or software, um, we need to prove out the adverse bottom line impacts that if the board doesn't set the tone at the top, if they don't prioritize the governance framework of the firms that they oversee or, or enable management to do that, um, the real world risks of what that means to them. And we, we've talked about a lot of those today. And so part of our job when we work with boards is not, you know, you have this vendor with this supply chain and specific risks. It's Hey, Amazon bought a server that was infiltrated by the CCP. Log4j is ubiquitous in your software development. Here are some risks and critical vulnerabilities and exploitations against them. And here's the billions of dollars that firms lose regularly because they refuse to take action. And once we align, I think, the strategic um, goals of a board against the bottom line, they're, they're almost always bought in. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any more information on yourselves, any of the topics we've touched upon in this podcast, or um, Exeter in general, what would be the best way for them to uh, find out? I think anybody can head over to Exeter.com. Um, they can also shoot both Andrew and I an email. We have profiles on the website to contact us directly. And we're, we're very approachable and oftentimes open to conversations with anybody that may want to have them with us outside of, outside of business. Andrew and I always like to geek out a lot about ICT and telecommunications and just supply chains in general. Well, gentlemen, um, as I said, uh, I gauge a podcast success on how much I learned and how much fun I had. And you guys hit both. Uh, if our listeners really want to geek out, these guys can do it, but they can geek out a way that they can take the step back and really give you a 30,000 foot view to help you understand what can be perceived as a highly technical supply chain risk area. So I wanted to thank you both for taking the time to visit with me. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you, Tom. Really enjoyed being on with you today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. I hope you'll join me tomorrow when I visit with Jennifer Nestor and Teresa Campoboso as we look at supply chain issues in the defense industry sector. You can join the fight to secure our global supply chain by obtaining early access trial licenses to Exeter Supply Chain Explorer by visiting exeter.com and we've linked to the site on the show notes. You can also find out how Exeter is making the world a safer and more effective place to do business by following Exeter on LinkedIn or reaching out to any of the experts featured on today's podcast. This special five-part series has been a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.